You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about making machine learning work in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, I'm talking to Max and Sergey. Max Jaderberg is the chief AI officer at Isomorphic Labs, and Sergey Yeknin is the CTO. Isomorphic Labs is a drug discovery company spun out of DeepMind, and so we talk about the drug discovery process itself and how it's been impacted by recent advances in deep learning. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, why don't we start by, uh, could you guys introduce yourselves and your and your company? Yeah, sounds good. Um, my name is Sergey. Um, I'm the CTO here at Isomorphic Labs. have been with the company for two and a bit years. Actually, me and Max started like maybe a week or two apart. Max first, uh, me second. But, you know, we feel like we've been there since the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I, I've had a long history in, in, in tech, working in a number of different areas, building, building tech products uh, for different companies and in, in, in various sectors and financial technology and risk management and geospatial software um, in sort of e-commerce and then also spent quite a bit of time working in healthcare for the past 10 years plus really focusing on research in the cancer genomics landscape and then also took some of that research into the industry working at a company called Sophia Genetics where I was CTO and then, you know, now for the last two years plus in the, in the drug discovery space. Awesome. And yeah, I'm, I'm Max Yoderberg, uh, the chief AI officer at ISO. Um, yeah, started with Sergey. Um, you know, I think there was uh, what, four or five people in the company when we, when we started, um, you know, been building out all of the machine learning models, the research and how we apply those models to drug discovery here. I was a deep mind beforehand for seven, eight years, working on a lot of core deep learning, generative modeling, reinforcement learning, these big challenge domains that DeepMind loves, um, with a background in, before that, in you know, computer vision and deep learning, really building out some of these uh, first networks for computer vision with, with deep neural networks and, and had a company in that space as well. And so I guess actually neither of you are approaching this directly from a bio background then. Yeah, right? I mean, I would say we're 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 learners uh, somewhere along the journey. Um, I've been, you know, in the sort of healthcare slash bio space for about ten years now, but I always feel like this is such a deep field, and there's also so many different disciplines as well. You always feel like you you kind of know next to nothing, but uh, you know, you get comfortable with being uncomfortable about it. I guess. Yeah, th there's a lot of leaning into. Uh, asking the stupid questions, probably repeatedly, um, a few months apart, and yeah, just trying to really take on board this new science, which is fascinating, and biology in particular is so deep um, that you know I don't think you can ever really feel like you finished that. But we're quite lucky, lucky in the sense that we have some amazing colleagues, some you know fantastic world expert chemists and biologists around us that you know really help help us along the way. Well, so that's great. So you can empathize with uh, me and probably most of the audience here and maybe kind of take us along um, for the journey. And maybe the place to start is um, what drug discovery is at a high level and how ML fits into that process today. Yeah, sounds good. You want to take it away? Yeah. I mean, you know, very high level. What are you trying to do with drug, drug discovery is um, effectively modulate the pathway of a disease. So there's a disease and, and a whole patient population out there um, that we want to help by designing drugs. And these drugs go into the body and you know, modulate on some functional level um, the process of this, this disease in the body. So when we think about this at ISO, we're really thinking about designing small molecules, the sort of things that you can um, take as a pill. And these molecules will be absorbed into the blood, into the cells even, and attach themselves to these proteins, which are the functional building blocks of, of, of people. And by attaching themselves to that, they'll either disrupt or modulate the functional behavior of those proteins, and so change the disease state of the person. And so, you know, drug design is all about, okay, what exactly are those molecules that are, A, going to attach themselves to these specific proteins that are involved in disease, 
a whole suite of proteins um, and also be you know good drugs in the sense that you can actually take them as a pill they'll get into the bloodstream they'll get to the right part of the body um, and they won't cause any toxic side effects for example and so like what's the typical process of doing drug discovery like what did it look like 20 years ago maybe what yeah. does it look like it, today it, 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 or not I yeah so, sorry like good I, I think it's a great question i think one thing that you know max picked up on there that's that's really important is um, something that our CSO Miles often tells us that this is a drug design process, less so than a drug discovery process in the sense that we, we, we don't find these drugs. We want to be able to design them specifically to solve a problem. And this is actually a, a bit emblematic of, of the type of journey that we're actually trying to go on with isomorphic labs as well in the sense that, you know, over the last decades, one would rely a lot on you know, deep understanding of chemistry by human experts, a lot of intuition, you know, some understanding of, of the disease, but it's a very much trial and error process in the sense that you might form a hypothesis based on your experience that, well, this type of molecule might fit really well into the type of po pocket in a protein where I want it to go. And then you would go and you would make those molecules, you know, you, you'd, you'd synthesize them in a lab and then you would actually test, you know, does it go there? Does it bind? Does it have some functional impact on, you know, the disease of interest for you? And so when you measure it, oftentimes you would discover, no, actually it doesn't. And so, you know, drug design is actually a, a very frustrating discipline in that, in that there's high degree of failure, even currently, you know, when we think about how this process is performed, you know, it takes 13 plus years on average for one drug to reach the market it costs three billion dollars plus per drug on average, and you know the process is really rife with 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 kind of toil and and, and failure. And one of our hopes is, of course, to be able to build a technology that'll be able to reason over this space in a much more rational manner, such that it becomes less about this you know trial and error and much more about rational design. And this is one of the things that excites us the most about what we're doing. And so, I guess what. My impression of ML applied to drug discovery is it kind of had some sort of early hype cycle, maybe five or 10 years ago where people got excited and then a little bit of, um, you know, kind of disappointment. And it sort of seems to be reemerging um, with a lot of enthusiasm. Do, do you think my outsider perspective is is accurate? And I guess, do, do you think that there's some technology that's, that's driving um, that feeling? Yeah, I, I, I think there's something to what you're saying. Um, there was a there was a first wave of companies, I think, that were, you know, really taking this approach of using machine learning to aid drug discovery. And I, I think there's sort of two fundamental strains of how you can think about machine learning in this space. One, and, and it goes towards this notion of: Are you building local models or global models? To generalize and you know, I think in the earlier days of machine learning for drug discovery a lot of focus was on building local models and what, what I mean by local model it's where you take a small amount of data on the order of thousands of data points that are very related to the exact problem that you want to solve today or tomorrow and you train a small model like a small MLP even random forest or SVM um, against that data and then you apply that model around, you know, just in that local region around the sort of data that you already know about. And so this can be really helpful if, for example, you know the specific part of molecular space that you're designing around. You've got some initial wet lab data, you know, real experimental data about what works, what doesn't. And you train a little model and you help use that to interpolate and extrapolate a little bit around this region of molecular space. Ed, sorry, before I let you go further, what does that data look like? I'm trying to picture, like, well, what are the, you know, I get, what are the rows and columns here? Yeah, um, you know, think about the problem of does this, um, does this small molecule bind to a particular protein? Now, in the world of local data, those rows and columns would literally just be um, the chemical formula of that molecule and the activity of, of that molecule. In and the, the way the data is that could be a one or a zero. And how is that data collected? Like they put the molecule on a test tube and and shake it or something? 
Yeah, yeah. There's like a few forms of shaking and the whole protocols for how you shake and for how long. And, you know, it depends on the, the protein that you're measuring against. Each each protein is might have a di like different set of subtleties in terms of how you set it up or how you might measure activity of this molecule against that protein. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, we think about this, for example, yeah, in, in, in a test tube test and in vitro test. So mm -hmm. speak. Got it. But okay, course, so that's the past. Like, yeah. Sorry, there's like millions of potentially different proteins and there's many, many more different molecules. And so oftentimes if you were building this model for a program, you would literally have the one protein that you're interested in and then some small number of you know potentially related molecules. And so you, the coverage of the space was quite small and that made it. Yeah. Got it. So in, so in that world, when you train this model on this small amount of data, it's very specific to just this protein that you're targeting, very specific to even the, part, the, the bit of molecular space that you have you know, data or molecules around, um, which means it's limited in its utility. It's, it's limited to that particular drug design program. And it might be, it might be useful, um, and in many cases it is, but at the end of the day, you can't really walk away with that model and reuse it on the next drug design program um, because it's too specific. So you would have to do that process again on the next program. Mm -hmm. And then I think what, what we've seen since, you know, maybe that first wave in 2015, 2016 um, are actually fundamentally new models. And I think really emblematic of this is AlphaFold and AlphaFold2. Um, these are the sort of models which I, I would call global models in the sense that they train on as wide a variety of data as possible in molecular space uh, and as a result, and of course, as a result of amazing deep learning and, and research, these models after training, they actually generalize outside of the distribution that they've been trained on to completely novel spaces in terms of protein sequences, in terms of, um, in, in terms of the molecules that they're able to predict accurately. So it's that type of model, these global models, that we're very much focused on building at ISO because um, you know, we believe that actually training on the most data gives us the best support for any drug design program that might come our way. Of course, we can specialize these models further if there is specific data, but really it gives us the best starting point and we're able to use this platform again and again um, on different drug design programs. And so just to make sure I'm following what you're saying, the input here is, is like a molecule and the output is some behavior. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So uh, an example model would be the input being um, uh, a protein and uh, a molecule, a, a mm -hmm. small molecule that could be a drug. And the output yeah. would be, okay, do these things interact? I see. And do you, do you, how do you feed a molecule or a protein into a model? Like, do you, do you actually like treat it like a string of, of chemical structure? Do you put in the, the name of the protein? How, how does that work? Yeah, that, you know, that's, that's the cool thing about these general models is you can actually just specify these inputs as strings, you know, strings of amino acids uh, or what's called smile strings for molecules, um, for example. You know, there's a lot of knowledge about the actual structure of these objects. So although it's just a string, you know, mm -hmm. in the neural network or the way that you process that string, you can, you can start embedding all of the known structure about these objects, uh, the bonds that are there, um, and, and even how these might look in 3D um, as a, to, to be inputted into the neural network and to be featurized by the neural network. And, and I mean, how do you feed that in? Like, do you actually somehow preserve the graph structure or is this literally just like a longer, longer string sort of specifying all the aspects of how the molecule looks? It, 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 it really depends on the application, on the model. Like a lot of this is very empirical. So, you know, sometimes sure. it's raw string work. Sometimes you want to embed the graph structure. Sometimes it's point clouds of, in 3D. Um, you know, it really depends on, on, the, on, the, on the application here. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the work here, like, you know, the rest of deep learning is very empirically driven. Um, yeah. I guess like one thing that is worth also mentioning, Lucas, is that drug design isn't really one machine learning problem. It's actually a whole like wide variety of different problems that call for specific representations of these systems. And, you know, when, when we think about even the moment when AlphaFold 2, for example, was announced, there's a lot of hype around like, well, 
maybe AlphaFold 2 like has solved drug design and, and, and we're done basically. And we're, we're not done. In fact, it's opened up the door for really amazing breakthroughs and it's really fundamentally solved the problem of predicting protein structure. But we feel there's probably on the order of 10 or so, you know, AlphaFold like challenges that need to be solved in order to actually be able to resolve this, this really complex set of questions, scientific questions around how do we design a drug that is going to solve, you know, solve the ultimate problem and have a whole bunch of other desirable properties as, as it's administered. But I think what I heard you saying earlier is that, you know, one of the big changes versus in 2015 is that, you know, kind of solving one task in the space informs other tasks. So you have some sense of like, I'm sort of imagining like the foundation models that we have um, in language. Is that a fair analogy? Yeah, I think I think it's a fair analogy, and this is the this is the sort of thing that we're starting to observe is, and and, and really work out is as a community is what are those foundational modeling problems in chemistry and biology that really translate into lots and lots of downstream performance and lots and lots of different tasks. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really exciting time for this field because I think there are a few hints of this bubbling up with things like you know, sequence modeling on protein, sequence modeling on, um, on, on DNA, on base pairs, on um, you know, structure modeling with AlphaFold and everything that can be done with that model. Uh, if you just take AlphaFold 2, that's you know, a single supervised learning task of predicting the 3D coordinates of proteins and, and, and protein, protein interactions. But if you look at the depth of publications that use this model, that hack on this model, that extend this model further, you can see there's so much you know, dark knowledge in this model that allows it to be used for many, many very useful down, downstream tasks that aren't directly structure prediction. But structure prediction clearly you know, is a precursor to thinking about these other downstream problems. But doesn't it kind of require a consistent representation? Like I would imagine you know, if, if you know, the, the core model had you know, say the molecular structure encoded in the way you feed in data, it'd probably be hard to feed in data as like a point cloud or something. Or are these models sort of multimodal in the same way that like GPT-4 is? A lot of these models operate in sequence space. Um, so whether they're protein sequence models or AlphaFold itself, like the input is a sequence. Um, but as we know from, you know, vision space from NLP, there's lots of opportunity to even use a model that's been trained in a single modality and extend it into other modalities as well, even without, you know, keeping these trunks frozen. So, you know, I think there can be a lot of creativity around how we use these models and how we leverage them outside of the, you know, particular training domain. I think one, one thing worth mentioning as well here is that, you know, in biology, there's room for several foundation models, I feel, because there's actually multiple scales and resolutions at which you can look at these different phenomena. And so, you know, at, at sort of the highest resolution level, you can look at sort of subatomic quantum level effects, and then you can step up to sort of atomic molecular level interactions. But then one level up is modeling what is going on inside cells or, or how to, you know, how to model the behavior or, or the function uh, or the fate of a particular cell, but then of course these get organized into tissues and these get organized into organs and then there's whole humans and even how humans interact with their environment. And so I think, you know, we have to be quite specific about which level of resolution we're talking about and we can build models that reason over that space. And there's also, we feel a lot of opportunity to actually then think about how we can integrate, how we can reason over multiple levels of resolution. But, you know, this is very much an open research question. I guess I feel like, you know, the NLP space, which is something I'm more familiar with, um, you know, people used to talk a lot about, you know, kind of um, higher order patterns, you know, like, um, you know, semantics and things. And even the data you would feed in would typically be already chunked into words and, and sentences. And then there's been sort of a general trend to be, you know, less opinionated in the data you feed in and, um, you know, maybe operate on a granular level, like just, you know, treating um, information as like a set of tokens with in, like less priors. Is there a similar thing happening as the data size increases in the realm of biology? 
yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing a very similar trend um, where more and more of the input representation gets to the like lower and lower granular level. I think two examples would be actually, you know, AlphaFold itself and, um, you know, moving to this AlphaFold latest model that we've been developing with, with Google DeepMind, we really think about tokenization of the particular elements um, and, you know, treating things in that sort of homogenous way allows more scalable architectures to be used. Uh, and for these, you know, your networks to actually extract that high level structure themselves. You know, same things uh, with this uh, recent model like Evo, uh, which is doing, um, you know, sequence modeling on the you know, base pair resolution. Again, putting minimal structure in, but larger amounts of data can hopefully allow a model to internally extract these high level representations, which could then be quite generic and be used for many downstream tasks. So I think it's a similar trend here. Are there any like differences in the way that you model um, this kind of data? Like, are you using transformers? Is it, is it like functionally just like um, the, the LLMs that come out or are there any kind of key differences that you have to do? Yeah, the big difference, Lucas, is that the scale of data is many orders of magnitude lower than in something like NLP or computer vision. So although you know we want to move in this direction, there's still not enough data, in my opinion, to have completely flat you know, sequence models and extract, I would say, enough about the world of proteins from just sequence data. You know, you can get far and there's, there's many protein sequence models that have done very well. Um, but I also think there's a lot of opportunity to actually inject, you know, priors, you know, whether these are physical priors, biological priors, chemical priors, um, structural priors into the way we represent the data, the architectures that process that, and also on the loss side, you know, the types of loss functions we use, or theory losses or other modeling tasks that are associated with this. So I think that's where the difference occurs today. But just because of the, the quantity of data, you don't quite have enough to just say, hey, we'll just stick a, a super deep flat transformer and, and, and let it run for a month or two. At the same time, I want to say that I think in the space, kind of the, the context length, the, the input size can be very, very large, actually, depending on obviously like how much of the system you want to be able to describe. But if we think about a problem where we want to be able to predict something about, you know, a, a clinical outcome or something like a disease prognosis for a person, you know, one might envision, you know, wanting to put in the whole genome, which could be, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data, essentially just a genome. But you may want to be able to also add, you know, other supplementary information around some of the imaging they may have done or different interventions, you know, all of the basically like clinical history. And so when we think about how to model that, we need to be able to, you know, model quite large input sizes. And even though we've seen, you know, quite a lot of progress, for example, with latest version of Gemini on, you know, really large context lengths, I think there's a lot to be still done there in terms of being able to support these kind of large scale inputs. Yeah. And, you know, to your point though, of course, we use transformers, the, an absolute workhorse of you know, on your network stack today. And, you know, and then the question comes into how do we transform these inputs to really be best processed by these, you know, generic and scalable neural network modules, just in the same way as, you know, for VIT, they have the question of, okay, how do we transform images in a way that's congruent with transformers? And okay, you've got this patch based mechanism, it's, you know, fairly straightforward for images. What's that equivalent for proteins, for structure, for genomes? Yeah. These are all things waiting to be, you know, we're, we're, we're along that path of discovering that, but I think it's really early days. Interesting. So you don't feel like it's resolved. I mean, I guess I'm imagining with strings, you could do a really similar tokenization strategy, but I guess with a, a graph structure or something it, or point cloud, it's kind of less obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Lots, lots of these things could be natively thought of as graph structures. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people working on graph neural networks for this sort of space. Um, but even think about, okay, how, how would we then transform a graph into something that could be ingested by a transformer? And does any of this actually make sense when we really think about the biology or think about this thing as a molecule rather than just a generic graph? And there's a lot of subtleties. There are things that work, 
Um, but I, I, I just think as a field, we're, we're, we're still quite early in this and there'll be lots of space to innovate. Even when you think about genomes, right, you could think ostensibly, okay, that's a linear linear sequence. You can follow like a very simple tokenization method. And indeed, actually, many of the current methods do that. But that may sort of ignore the fact that there's massive amounts of structure that are not linear in the genome. There is secondary tertiary structure in actually how those molecules are packed inside a cell, what could be actually the units that divide, you know, interpretable units of information in the genome. Oftentimes even different pieces can swing together for a particular event. And so I think when we think about data representation, it's important to also inform our, our tokenization strategy by actually some understanding of the underlying biology and sort of, you know, how, how these uh, molecules actually behave in the real world. Although it's kind of funny, as I listen to you, you sound like, you know, NLP researchers 10 years ago. I kind of, you know, I sort of feel like the tokenization strategies, from my perspective, get like simpler and simpler and, and sort of like more and more like painfully losing, you know, information and priors that seem really important. So I kind of wonder what, uh, well, how this will play out. I, I'd love for us to be in that regime. <laughs> I'm curious, um, you know, I remember like the, the nature paper that came out with um, ImageNet a long time ago. And, and I think one of the things that really was just so amazing about it, right, was taking, you know, CNNs trained on ImageNet and then applying them to um, detecting, you know, melanoma. And, and it, it kind of makes me wonder, like, is there ever a world where you would take, you know, models trained in entirely different um, you know, domains where there's tons of data, would they have any bearing on the domain that you're in? Is, uh, like, yeah, I feel like the, the, you know, the, the multitask applications just seem to be expanding beyond, you know, kind of anyone's wildest dreams. Like, could you imagine a world where, where, you know, sort of GPT or Gemini becomes relevant for what you do? Yeah. I mean, it, it's really interesting. There were these, you know, papers, I'm thinking about an Igor Mordech paper, for example, where you take a pre-trained uh, transformer large language model, and then you can just project arbitrary new problems into token space and just bootstrap off the internal reasoning that happens in a large language model for a comp completely different modality. Um, I don't think we've ever tried that, you know, going from language into natural language into protein language. Um, but I'm really curious if to, to see if this this sort of thing could emerge or, you know, similarly, if you start training a large language model on, um, on, on DNA, does any of that functionality, you know, for, for, for next token prediction, does any of that functionality translate into something when you're thinking about, I don't know, protein structure? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's possible and we can get some, some transfer there. But, you know, in my mind, there's also, for example, a difference between solving a problem enough where you can write an interesting paper about it and i think there's potentially lots of space for that or like solving a problem where it's solved in the real world and you know this there, there's a big difference for me there and you know especially at iso our biggest focus is to solve problems in the real world and my experience tells me that there isn't necessarily like an easy lift and shift like that. You need to spend a lot of time actually with the data and with the domain to still be able to get that that real like, you know, thorough solution. You know, I'll give you as an example, my experience at Sophia Genetics previously, where we were doing segmentation of tumors on the basis of like MRI and, and CAT scans. And of course, we tried a whole bunch of fairly sort of established vanilla methods from vision but you know what we learned actually is tumors are not like a lot of the other objects that you might normally train your model on they're not you know they're not cats and dogs and sort of other images on the internet and so you know the morphology of a tumor the space it takes it's, it's you know it, it can have a lot of different variability and it can be for example very globular but it can also be very diffuse uh, as it develops in the organ. And so, you know, we found that we really need to build quite specific models in order to be able to reach that performance where I'd be willing to start using that model to actually, you know, guide clinical decision making, for example, right? And so this is where I'm kind of going with that difference between what's enough to write a paper about versus what's enough to put into a medical device, for example. And, 
And so, some of this really interestingly comes down to that use in, you know, training these models for actual use in novel science. And it's that, that novel science bit, which is quite interesting because with machine learning, what is machine learning? Well, you take your training distribution and you try and fit a statistical model to it. And but when you're applying this model to novel science, by definition, you're trying to use this maybe in the very, very tails of that training distribution, maybe even completely outside of that. And that's quite unusual often when we think about the application of machine learning um, compared to, for example, self-driving cars. Um, and so there's a lot of subtleties in how do you transfer or how do you set up your train distribution? How do you set up your model training? How do you even apply that model um, downstream to actually do novel science? Mm. Do you think that there is overlap with what you do in research in material science? I feel like we've had a lot of folks, you know, come on here talking about um, kind of doing chemistry. Like, is that is that relevant to you? Are there data sets that you can draw on from that? Or is biology just kind of a completely different um, world? I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of interesting similarities, especially to my previous point on, on you know, training these networks to then extrapolate and, and, and discover new things. Um, somewhat annoyingly today, it feels like that inorganic chemistry is kind of a different world to the organic chemistry that we're working with. The types of problems, the types of data are different. Saying that, fundamentally, you know, physics is the same for these systems, right? So at some level, there has to be some notion of overlap or something we could transfer. Um, but I, I haven't seen much of that intersection and between those two feels like material science and for example, organic chemistry. I guess switching gears a little bit, how do you think about, um, you know, open source in your world? Like, you know, I feel like there's sort of this big debate around open source with these language models and these multimodal models. And, and I think there is starting to be like a little bit of open source, you know, models coming out. Like how do, how do you think about that at, uh, at isomorphic? Yeah, I guess the open source community, I think, is a is a great benefit, and we've all you know we've all benefited from that, and I think many also participate in it. So I think it's a great working ecosystem. I think it's important to basically balance the ability to you know to contribute to that ecosystem as well with the ability to develop specific unique capabilities that actually sort of sustain a business. And so I think, you know, that's what we're doing here at Isomorphic Labs as well. Totally. Um, what about data? I mean, I would think that, uh, you know, here the data sets are probably much more proprietary than than folks would be used to. Um, where, where do you think that goes? Well, I think there's actually quite a lot to be said for public data sets. Um, as we've seen, you know, tools like AlphaFold have been able to do amazing by working on, you know, being trained on the protein data bank. And, you know, I hope that statement doesn't trivialize the protein data bank because it's actually an amazing resource, the result of like, you know, thousands of years collectively uh, of, of research. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's still a lot to be said and certainly, you know, I would imagine any organization that goes into this space, you know, seriously would want to look at these public commercial data sets at the first instance, but there's of course also a lot of unique data sets. And, you know, one question to be asked is, you know, data that's been generated for a different purpose, like one might imagine data that's generated, for example, as part of a drug discovery program, how useful might that data be for training the type of models that, you know, me and Max have been talking about. If you're thinking about building a general model that works across all of chemical space, you know, you can see potentially limited usefulness in, in, in data points that are very near to each other in that space, actually. And so when we think about data, you know, we, we, we think very carefully about data set diversity, being able to cover as much as possible. Uh, of course, some of these spaces, you know, we, we think about the space of, for example, all of drug-like molecules is something like 10 to the power of 60 molecules large. So sort of any notion of coverage of that space, um, I, I, I think, you know, will, will be a long time synthesizing data for that. But it's still quite important when we think about data set design. And so when one thinks about 
data, we basically need to go both to data sets that already exist, but also be ready to generate new data sets that will help us actually you know, go into and, and, and get great performance on areas that have never been tried by humans before. You know, it's interesting, I guess I don't want to take this in a weird direction, but I sort of have to, to flag. I mean, 10 to the 60 possible drugs actually seems quite small, right? I mean, that, that actually is much smaller than I was expecting. I mean, I feel like you could compress that, you know, into like 30 characters or less. But I, I think maybe now I'm think, wondering, do I actually even understand what the space of possible drugs is here? I think it's pretty huge. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can think about rationalizing it, like the 10 to the 60 space when, you know, you think about like what each one of those objects is. It's this unique 3D arrangement of atoms. And it's not just about the 3D arrangement, but, you know, that arrangement in complex with the environment in the cell, so the protein. And the arrangement, specif you know, these are not just identical atoms, but these are different charges. You know, that precise both local and global arrangement changes that whole electron density around that 3D structure Right. So yeah. totally. So, but how do you get that down to 10 to the 60? I mean, I'm just picturing, you know, if I, if I could string together, you know, 60 atoms of choice, like that would be, um, more than 10 to 60, right? Like what, what, what actually yeah. constrains the space? Yeah. So, I mean, 10 to the 60 is actually like a very huge number, but you know, the, the way to think about this, there's, there's some rules that heuristics really that humans have developed of drug likeness that basically constrains the set of molecules. Indeed, you can create you know infinite numbers of molecules, but there's certain constraints around size, for example. So you know one of the things that needs to happen for your drug to work, especially if it's a small molecule, is it needs to be able to go into the cell, and so the cell is only going to be able to take in molecules of a certain size. And then there's other issues like these molecules need to be soluble, these molecules need to be able to go through membranes, that they need to have other behaviors. And so basically you can write a few heuristics that constrain that space to 10 to the power of 60. But in, you know, in fact, you, you may need to search a much larger space in the end, but this is just something that helps us you know, think a little bit around some boundaries around what the usable sort of useful molecule space might look like. Okay, well, team can decide if they want to leave that in, but that was actually kind of enlightening um, for me. Thank you. Um, do you um, at Isomorphic have an ambition to take the drugs all the way to commercial viability, or do you kind of stop short of that? How, how does it work? Yeah, it's a um, it's a fascinating space actually, and and one that's been you know really interesting to learn more about as as we have you know worked in the space for a couple of years, but I think. It's, um, there are different stages of that drug design pipeline and a particular asset has an amount of value that is essentially corresponding to the amount of risk that is inherently left in that asset. So when you think about you know, the stages, it's sort of like target discovery. And so when you've identified a really cool target, there's already some value in that. And then you go into hit ID, sort of um, lead optimization stages. At some point, you're going to go through preclinical studies, clinical trials, you know, one, two phases, one, two, three. At each point in time, you will have addressed and managed a certain amount of risk. And so the value of your program goes up. And so there isn't actually one single answer as to where, where to stop. It really depends on your own appetite to take on the risk and on your own ability to actually do something with that. And so when we think about where should one stop, you know, we have created, of course, isomorphic labs to bring a unique angle of how machine learning can help transform drug design. And so that's one you know, lens that we apply. And then the other one is basically how much of sort of that process are we willing to go through in order to maximize the value of each molecule? And so as we rationalize our portfolio, we're basically working very actively to say, well, we think this needs to go over here and that's a sweet spot for that particular asset. And you know, for this one over here, we should be able to partner with somebody who we think will be much better able to actually execute, for example, the clinical trial stage of that. And so that's a great idea to work with them on that molecule. 
Interesting. Do you, would you do your own clinical trials? Wouldn't that be quite a departure from your core competency or is there like ways that ML could, could play a role there? I see lots of opportunities for ML to play a role in that. And, you know, there are ones that we're thinking about as well. To me, you know, the most obvious is, you know, when, when you have a, there's, there's kind of two problems. One is you, you want to identify a disease and then you want to find the right molecule for patients with that disease. But there's also sort of the other side of that problem, which is when you've designed a molecule, you want to find the best patients for that. And so part of that is solved within the clinical trial um, sort of phase of, of, of drug development. But, but even after that molecule is on the market, you know, we have things like companion diagnostics. How can I find patients with the right, for example, genomic signature to be best fit to benefit from this medication? And so there's plenty of opportunities for us to apply machine learning and thinking about for example, how do the genetics of, of someone influence, you know, the type of disease that they have, or how can we better classify diseases based on molecular signatures? And so, you know, we see all of these as great opportunities for um, us to be able to optimize things like clinical trials. If you think about the numbers, Lucas, basically 90% of molecules that enter clinical trials actually fail. Uh, so, you know, these are not great numbers and these are, you know, some of the ones that are behind what we're seeing as these like really high costs, really long timeframes for bringing these molecules to market. And, and so they seem like really amazing opportunities to actually be able to go afterwards. And so I think there's, you know, there's a lot to be said for working in that area. And I guess dumb question from the outside, but why do so many molecules fail? I mean, you, you described like a pretty simple sounding task, like, okay, like, does it like, you know, bind to a protein or not? And like, that's the plan. Presumably, you know, if it binds to the protein before you ever, you know, put it in any living organism, I, I would think, I mean, is it because the drugs turn out to have like unanticipated side effects or, or what, um, what happens along the way? Yeah, I mean, there's the side effects, but you know, just back to this point, Okay, of course, you, you test that this drug binds to the, the protein, but maybe that's just in isolation in a test tube. Now, when it's in a cell, does it actually get into the cell and, and bind to the protein? And Okay, even then, does that cause the functional effect that you hypothesized this would cause, that this binding event would cause on this whole signaling pathway, for example, that this protein might be part of? You might have just had this biology wrong. So, you know, you, you, even your hypothesis of the signal, signaling pathway might be wrong. Um, you might be targeting completely the wrong protein. So that, you know, when you start, you can measure all this efficacy in, in cells even. And when you go into um, looking at the effect on the disease, you don't see any effect there. Um, and that's before you even begin to look at all the, the toxicity, as you were talking about, um, just how this molecule breaks down, what effect that can have on the body. But also, you know, sometimes these, these molecules, and more often than not, they don't just hit one protein target. They'll actually end up hitting a whole range of targets. And so what's the effect of that hitting of completely unintended targets? That can have some very serious you know, consequences. So, yeah, there's, qu there's quite a lot that can go wrong um, in this pipeline. And, you know, as, as we talk about this, you can see that there's lots and lots of opportunities to understand and model more and more about this microscopic world, about disease biology, how all of these things connect together. And as we understand more about the different pieces of this puzzle, that means that when we go to design a molecule and we select the target that we're designing against, we, we can do that in a way which we have higher and higher confidence in our hypotheses of this will actually produce the desired effect on the disease that we're trying to address. How do you decide what diseases to, to target? Like, is there like an experimental phase where you just kind of contemplate like anything and sort of, you know, see what looks promising? Or do you kind of pick like one disease where you feel like sure that there's a big market and there's sort of like a known kind of pathway and you just sort of like look to, you know, find something new to do there? Yeah, that's a great question, Lucas. In fact, you know, just like deciding how far to take your, your molecules, this is another quite complex problem. And, you know, I feel like 
we're actually very lucky to be able to build you know, these general models at ISO that allow us to target many different diseases. You know, this is one of the things that excites me the most about what we're building here in terms of technology. And so when, when we think about that space, you know, actually to begin with, anything is game. And then you need to form some hypotheses indeed around what, you know, what market opportunities exist there. You need to be able to think about the technology that we have, where does it actually perform best? And so we need to have a set of opinions about what is going to be more or less tractable. You know, every drug design program is, you know, a, a long mission that takes, you know, many years, it takes many millions of dollars. And so the commitment to go and do one is actually a substantial decision. And so you end up building this kind of model that, you know, builds in all, all of these factors around you know, what is the what is the disease burden? What is the patient need there? Um, what is the market opportunity? What is the technology fit? Um, all of these different factors. And then that allows you to go into particular disease areas and then you look deeper and, you know, you, you need to find potentially unique, uh, important targets and you have to dis basically decide where, where are you going to enter? You know, another another aspect of this is, you know, who else is doing what in that space as well? You know, how far have people already advanced their understanding about a particular disease? And so if you go in there, are you going to be building, for example, a first in class medicine? Nobody has a medicine for this particular indication. Or are you going to be building a best in class medicine? Somebody has already a drug on the market and are you going to be able to build something better? Because, you know, the economics and, and all of it is quite different in these two cases. Is, is there a medicine out in the market today that, that I might use that was discovered using these machine learning techniques? I don't believe we have anything on the market at the moment that can be sort of straightforwardly linked to having been discovered using these types of techniques uh, at the very least. I mean, I think people have been using, as Max has said, you know, various sort of types of machine learning for probably the past two decades that said there's a number of molecules in clinical trials now that would have been developed sort of with at least what I would call, you know, the last generation of machine learning methods. I mean, do, do these new advances in sort of the early part of the funnel mean that there's now lots more candidate medicines that seem likely to work that people would want to try? Like, I would think that these techniques would work much better at kind of the top of the funnel, if you even think of it like a funnel, I'm imagining a funnel that sort of goes from like, you know, kind of cheap candidates that seem to work in a test tube all the way to like gone through every, um, every trial. Is there sort of like a glut now at the top of the funnel of, of like, now we got really good at that and we need to figure out like which ones to send through? Like, are, are there going to be like kind of changes downstream coming from all this effort? I focus yeah. on the top. You know, I, I think, I think this is, Part of the opportunity, at least when we think about hit identification, or is you know it, it can look a bit like a funnel, right? You start with more stuff, and over time, more things drop out because you realize the negative aspects against that particular design or that particular molecule. But of course, if you have techniques that allow you to discover or design more and more initial hits, and then then as you go through those stages of further and further experimentation or further design even though some things might drop out, you still have tons in your funnel that you can take forward. And then by having a wider array, array of molecules that you're taking forwards, by the end of your design process, when you're thinking about, okay, what do we actually lead with? Um, and even thinking about backups, you would hope to have much higher quality molecules there and a lot more to choose from um, for then subsequent clinical studies. I see. So you think that you're your rate will go up like, like more than 10% will get through the funnel because there's more options and you can, you could actually model what's going to happen through the, through the life of the drug. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to be much better at being able to tell what's going to happen. And in fact, we already are. And, and, and so I very much expect that rate to go up. Uh, there's many different inputs into that, but I think it's worth saying, Lucas, like, Nothing is really easy in this space. It's not really like a low-hanging fruit kind of space where, you know, 
there hadn't been like big technological breakthroughs and then sort of technology comes in and kind of swoops in and just solves it all. Uh, I, I don't think it really works like that here because it's really cutting edge science, you know, at the edge of sort of what is known to humanity now. And there's been a massive industry of, you know, the world's smartest, most impassioned people thinking about the space. And, and, and so, you know, breakthroughs, are, I think, are going to come by developing these fundamental capabilities. They're going to advance our knowledge. And then we're going to apply them in very smart ways to be able to solve the hardest problems. So I would say it's less of a question of, like, picking up a whole wide, of, wide range of, like, simple problems and just going to town on them. It's actually unlocking things that nobody's been able to do before. You know, we have this disease. We have this target. We have no idea like where to bind to the target and how to actually make it work. And then by being able to model that space rationally and, and you know rather quickly in silico, we should be able to make inroads in, in, into some of these like really fundamentally difficult diseases. Well, why do you say that there's not a lot of low hanging fruit? Like I would imagine being able to model this task in silico versus actually trying it in a lab would just be like a massive increase in efficiency. Is it because the, the modeling isn't reliable? No, it's, it's not that. I mean, I think it is a massive increase in efficiency, but it's a very complex, multifaceted problem, right? And so I think while we're going to be able to massively improve the speed, massively able to improve the accuracy with which we're making predictions, and so I expect things to contract, but actually the whole problem of designing a drug from identifying a target to sort of having something that's been proven to be efficacious and you know non-toxic and have all the other properties, I think is going to be a series of very, very hard challenges. Um, and so you know I think we, we, we need to set our expectations accordingly as well in that sense. How far along are you in that journey? Like can you can you talk about like how how many steps have happened with your, your furthest along uh, drugs? Yeah, well, look, um, we, you know, the way to think about isomorphic labs is we're, we're only, you know, two and a little bit of years in existence. And so, you know, of course, our first port of focus has been to develop our technology platform. And so this is something that we have been doing since the very start, of course, building on top of AlphaFold that has been sort of a key enabling technology in the space that gives one a foothold into this, you know, structure-based and silico drug design space. And so we have developed a number of these methods. And then over the course of the past year, we have started doing actual drug design programs using the technology that we have developed. And so, you know, a year in drug discovery is a fairly short period of time. And so we have a number of these programs that are both our own set of our own internal targets as well as the ones that we have partnered for with you know the two partnership announcements that we have made with Eli Lilly and Novartis and so I would say it's quite early days for that portfolio but we have been making you know pretty steady progress through that and already today we're seeing you know, how all of that modeling work that we've been doing over the last two years is actually changing the way that the chemists are approaching the day-to-day -day drug design. And yeah, that's super exciting and, and, and really speaks to this longer term, you know, inflection point in, in how, you know, chemists approach drug design long term. What what is the role that chemists play? Like I would think, you know, in in you know, in kind of like language modeling today, I don't think there's a lot of linguists involved at this point. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah. How does that work? You know, it, it's interesting you say that there's not a lot of linguists involved at this point. But then, you know, the fact of the matter is, every single machine learning researcher who works on NLP is an expert at language, mm -hmm. right? Just by being a human, it's the same thing with computer vision. That yeah. every single person is an expert actually at computer vision or human vision, and so there's a. It's very easy to take these internal priors and directly translate them into your machine learning models and, and your workflows. And even on the product side, how you then take those models and change the way you do, um, you know, you write a blog or you write a script with a, a large language model, we all have these intuitions internally. It's very different in chemistry space because, you know, me and Sergey, for example, we're not native chemists. 
Um, so we wouldn't have that native intuition about you know, how these mo how chemistry can relate or can be maximally exploited by some of these models. So I think there's two ways that chemists come into this picture. One is on helping us develop this platform, helping us build these models and really attacking this fundamental science in the right way with machine learning and deep learning. And then the other place that chemists come in, of course, is on the actual drug design. You know, maybe there'll be a world, I'm sure there will be, where we can press play and out pops your drug. Um, but before we're at that point from a model, we're of course going to have human drug designers, chemists in the loop, you know, working with these models, being very creative together in that process to design molecules together. Mm. Okay, we always end with two questions, and I want to give some space for them because I'm really interested in your in your answers. Um, one thing that I, I would love to hear about is kind of on that journey from you know more research paper oriented work to trying to make this like really you know, productionized and really working for um, your use case. What have been the kind of unexpected challenges? Well, I would say from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like building on the theme that Max has just covered is the data understanding is a really difficult problem, essentially, right? We cannot just eyeball, you know, a chemical reaction or we cannot eyeball something that happens inside a cell at a molecular level and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, that's a good data point. Uh, you know, we should keep that one. And so I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a big perennial challenge in the space to really be able to have great experimental design, to be able to generate really high quality data sets, to be able to actually use in, in, in training these methods. And so, you know, basically making progress in the space is, is, you know, linked a lot to our ability to design these data sets and understanding. And I think it's, you know, it's um, kind of a challenging scientific pursuit, essentially, to be able to really, you know, really make heads or tails of, of a lot of these phenomena. Yeah. And then on the other side of the sort of model development spectrum, I think how these models get should be applied to actual drug design, to actual science, I think is always, um, you know, work in progress and ever evolving as these models and the characteristics change. Again, it comes back to this point of, you know, we train these models on a generic distribution of data, and then we try and stretch and apply them to the very tails and the very frontiers of what this model could know. Of co you know, taking those raw capabilities, a raw capability like AlphaFold, and then applying it to a very particular drug design challenge, you know, a target that no one knows anything about, um, the very frontier of you know, medicinal chemistry, poses lots of challenges. There's, of course, going to be lots and lots of you know, dark knowledge in this model that we need to work out how to extract for this very particular use case. And I've seen again and again in this context, even in previous contexts at DeepMind, that there needs to be a lot of creative work in how you extract that juice, how you extract that dark knowledge for these really particularly challenging applications. And that's really a magic spot as well. Re really exciting, but very difficult as well. Can you say anything about how you've done that or how you've approached that? Um, a lot of this would, I'd say, fall under the, the hacking sort of moniker. And you totally. know, I, I use that in the best sort of way, I think. You know, we see again and again, it doesn't matter what domain actually with deep learning, that you, you put these models in front of people who are really passionate about applying them and really extracting juice out of them. And people will find amazing ways to mold and hack and just completely mash up or pipeline these systems together in a way that they were never trained for, no one ever thought about before. But actually, you do this and, and you can find some way to interpret like that statistical inference in a completely new way and it really gives value to people and we see the same thing day to day you know for chemists for example so you're talking about the chemists you're working with or the machine learning engineers primarily doing this they'll be side by side doing this together yeah. um so yeah the chemists might not be doing the native hacking but the machine learning engineer will do that and they'll do it together <laughs>
I mean, actually, I, I do want to add that to me, this has been probably, you, you asked about the hardest things. One of the things that has been the most enjoyable is at being able to actually integrate these disciplines together. You know, we often hear about some horror stories where, you know, company X for, you know, AI for drug discovery goes off, r raises money to, to do this. And, and build technology and the technology doesn't quite work yet you know you need to do drug discovery and so you go off and you end up having this disconnect between essentially your drug discovery teams and your teams building the tech and one of the things that we have built into kind of the DNA of the company is we're in this together to solve these problems together and so this is you know reflected into how we've structured projects you know we have chemists deeply involved in all of our machine learning projects as subject matter experts, as, as folks that are, you know, team members, we sit together as teams sort of interspersed with each other. And, you know, similarly, when we think about doing the drug discovery programs, our machine learning engineers and researchers are deeply embedded in those programs to make sure that we're getting the best of the tech. And so to me, you know, this has been like a really integral part of actually how to, how to crack this for real. You know, it's funny. I, I really try not to inject um, weighted biases into this into these conversations at all, but I, I kind of can't help myself because um, I I always wonder if people are using our visualization stuff for um, bio examples. Like, you know, we have a molecule viewer that always, um, it demos really well because it just sort of seems like science. I think it probably demos better to like the non-bio customers because it, you know, everyone fantasizes about being a scientist that can look at structure and, and, and see that. But is that actually like a useful way uh, to look at data to literally like see the molecule or, or how do you um, actually look at the data? I mean, I guess it's so much harder than with uh, text or images. What What's the process? Yeah, and it'll, it'll depend on who wants to view the data. You know, if, if you're a medicinal chemist, you will happily sit there and look at a page of hundreds of molecules like a, scroll, literally like a picture of them or like the scientific like the, notation the, the, of them from my the, chemistry the, class? The 2D picture graph notation ah, of them. Nice, um, yeah, yeah. Just roll through that and, you know, these amazing people, you know, I think about like someone used to sit next to Eric, like just looks at the molecule and be like, ah, because you can reel off characteristics about that just intuitively. Um, but then, of course, like as we scale up the number of molecules that we could be you know, assessing or, 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 or think about generating, then this could go into thousands or hundreds of thousands. And you could think about, you know, very unique visualizations or landscapes of these things as we're able to measure more and more properties or predict more and more properties with our models. We can then think about how, how to surface those properties, that whole multidimensional characterization of each individual molecule, and then project that in a space that a chemist can browse through and really start to intuit about so mm. there's lots of opportunities actually this raises a great point as well lucas even about the wider like about the wider field which is product like how do we actually we can develop really amazing tech we can build really great models but we want those models to solve real world problems and you know product plays a really crucial role in that and i feel like that is a muscle in sort of the wider tech space that we've been able to grow really well, like how to obsess over what that problem is, like who are the users, how, what do we need to build to really move the needle? And so we've like integrated that as well. You know, we have a product team that are working really closely with the machine learning side to really understand these capabilities and both like learn and give feedback into that research roadmap. But then on the other side, like also working very closely with chemists and biologists to understand those workflows. And so, you know, we, we don't just have a collection of models, like you're not just running a bunch of collabs as you use this. You, you, you have sort of an interface, you have a fully formed product that you can log on to and you can run your drug design project inside. And that puts all of those models into the context of what you're doing as a chemist and, you know, helps with your workflow and you need to be able to visualize all of this. And so, you know, I think it's a key actually aspect of how we think, you know, the translation of some of this technology into real world impact really, really works. And I feel like that's an important piece even for the wider industry as, you know, we have a lot of cool technology that is looking for that like real product insight and product application. 
Totally. Well, if you have any um, suggestions of, you know, visualizations or queries you like to, to push into us, we would be overjoyed to get that form of feedback. Well, send some um, feature requests. Please. I, I would love to hear them. I could, we could take it, <laughs> we could take it out of this conversation, but I'm, I'm dying to hear it. Um, and, you know, my last question to take things in a totally different direction, if you don't mind, um, but this has often been interesting, is like when you think about, um, you know, machine learning in general, it could be inside your field or outside of your field. Is there any kind of research topic you think is underexplored or like a research result that really excited you that you think didn't get, um, you know, the attention it served? Or maybe another way of thinking about it is, is if you didn't have your current job, is there something interesting that you would want to look into? Well, on my side, maybe is um, you know when I, I'm really passionate about healthcare, so I think my topics are are, are you know quite often about healthcare. But I awesome. you know I see I see sort of neuroscience as like one of the biggest mysteries that is like left in our overall understanding of actually how biology works. We, we you know we still have quite basic ideas about how brains work and how we form like these larger, you know, larger sort of concepts around our world models and our memories and so on. And so to me, you know, if I was to think about a domain where, you know, we, we haven't really had that yet, like that aha moment yet, that would be the domain. And I think there's lots to be said for machine learning in that space, but also for, you know, other forms of modeling, simulation and so on. But, you know, I would look for, for that as a key, you know, key space to really make impact in. On my side, um, I, I think at the very core, you know, I love deep learning. I've sort of been at the core, always developing new neural network modules and ways that these pieces could be put together or how you, you know, add new functionality into neural networks. And I'm, I just always love seeing the latest layers, normalizations, you know, um, ways of conditioning, ways of modulating attention mechanisms and and playing with these things and, and putting everything together in new ways, I think it's, it's great fun at ISO because we get to, you know, look at all of this, develop new stuff and leverage all of it for completely new data types. So mashing up all these things in, in ways that aren't defined um, in the original research. Um, I think if it wasn't in ISO space, you know, I, I think back to some of the later research I was doing at DeepMind on, on open-ended learning, really thinking about okay, how do we use then these fundamental building blocks of deep learning um, and create these scalable learning systems that can just learn even without human labeled data or just bootstrapping perhaps off the initial bit from human labeled data against you know, environments, whether that's simulations or the real world to learn more and more and more about the world. Uh, ultimately so that you can come along and give this, this agent any task uh, down the line. So I love that space as well. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Um, any, any like research paper you'd want to point us to there that we could put in the show notes? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll plug the Xland work, which was some of the work from us from, from, from DeepMind, which was baby steps along that way of, you know, how do you just create these, uh, environment universes and train agents and populations of agents against this space. So at the end of the day, you start getting these agents which can exhibit, you know, start to exhibit general capabilities to zero shot to any new task. Mm. Awesome. Well, that, that topic seems more and more relevant uh, these days. Um, yeah, how to supply that in the language space. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe in, in, in bio, you know, what would happen. Oh. Yeah, I think there's lots of analogs to how we can do drug design here, to be honest. Very cool. Well, thank you so much um, for your time. It was a lot of fun. Been a pleasure, Lucas. Yeah, great to see yeah. you. Yeah, good to see you, and, and yeah, great to work with you guys. And I really mean it on feature requests. Um, you know, I think the, you know, I, I also think healthcare is the coolest um, ML applications, and yeah. I personally would just love to give you guys better tools. Um, it seems like the one where it's the hardest to actually look at your data, and I do feel like actually looking at your data is like just the key to uh, success, <laughs> broadly. Yeah. I mean, as we ramp up the usage of the of weights and biases, I'm sh I'm sure there'll be lots of ideas coming. I really don't mind either, like really specific, tiny stuff. Like I feel like that's the stuff we never get. But if anything is just like irritating you, 
Uh-huh. Just don't be shy. Like, you know, tell tell your team, just send it to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a key piece of our sort of technology infrastructure. And I think, you know, people have loved working with it. But there's always more things. There's always more scaling. And so I'm sure there'll be no shortage of requests. We'll definitely take you at your word, Lucas. Okay, great. Really appreciate it. Have a great Cheers, day. Cheers, man. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Gradient Descent. Please stay tuned for future episodes.